to avoid large stands of existing trees and rock outcrops to make it look like an old Cape Elizabeth road. And I think we were trying to do that, and certainly you can see that in the, in the alignment. Uh, in doing so, we we're hoping to preserve as many trees as possible uh, where the, the roadway goes through existing stands of forest. Um, how well we're going to be able to do that remains to be seen. Um, it's our intention, though, to, uh, I hate to use the word surgically, implant a row, but we're trying to, to see if we can do as much as we can to keep the, the road to the absolute minimum in terms of the clearing required. Having said that, uh, we're hoping that a lot of the existing forest land will then be the actual edge of the, the roadway. Uh, there may not be the need to plant additional trees. In fact, we're showing in some places where there hopefully will not be a need for an additional grading, that there probably will be trees greater than three or four inches in, in caliper that will serve as the street tree or as that edge that ultimately grow into that canopy that we all envision having out in Dominicus Crossing in years to come. Um, we felt that there were probably three different approaches, though, to, to planting new trees in the development. One is what you can call the monoculture approach. In other words, take a species, a red oak, let's say, that we know will do very well out here, and plant it up one side and down the other. And in time, with many, many generations, that tree or those tree species will grow up and form a very wonderful canopy. Um, how that will do in competition with the other trees that are hopefully going to be saved along the way um, is a question that we would have to deal with. Uh, the second approach uh, would be to, to take individual streets and say, well, on Leighton Road, maybe we plant linden trees, and maybe on Tomas Road, we plant tulip trees, and maybe someplace else we plant horse chestnuts and so forth. And to give each street its own character based upon uh, the trees that are saved as well as the trees that are introduced. The third approach would be to take a look at the trees that are on the town's uh, approved list of street trees and to try and intersperse them uh, with a, a fairly wide variety um, throughout the development, keeping a core of maples, uh, well not maples, um, of oak trees, in some places uh, maples, but certain types of trees that were, that were tolerant to salt and tolerant to the, the conditions that we're experiencing out here. Hopefully, though, we'll be saving uh, a large number of trees and they will not require us to plant as many as we're showing on the planting plan. Those are the ones that we're prepared to plant, although it will certainly behoove us, from certainly an economic incentive, to save as many of the existing trees as we can. Uh, in talking with the tree warden, um, in presenting him these three options, his, his ideal situation would be to, to go for a variety of trees, a diversity, which is fairly typical of a lot of older subdivisions. You find people who lived there for a long time before uh, towns had tree planting programs who would go out and plant their own trees along the right of ways. And as a result, you find trees of, an, of, of a wide variety along the Esplanade. Um, I think that Maureen has probably convinced us that we're probably probably have gone a little bit heavy in the variety, and we would think that as we refine uh, the planting plan, and I'm certainly willing to hear what all of you have to say, uh, we, could, we could merge what we're showing here with maybe a, a, that second option, that second ideal of a way of looking at individual streets, giving them more of an ind individual identity. That's not to say that we wouldn't like to use all these trees out here. There are some trees that I think are very special and are very appropriate in the right location. Uh, I know that uh, we had a discussion about the use of willows, and I, we do not use willows as a street tree. There is one location on Lorenzo Lane where we were crossing the wetland, and we felt it would be very uh, appropriate to plant a willow out in the middle of the wetland just as an accent. Um, we have done a lot of research. We have talked to the tree warden. Uh, we are comfortable with the, the species that are on here, but at this point I would love to hear what you all have to say about uh, the whole subject of street trees. So glad you asked. <coughs> well, I, I also like to hear some discussion about staking and location of trees, too, because the tree warden and we and you may not always be on the same wavelength. <coughs> Would anyone like to speak? Mr. Wilcox? Madam Chair, I'll offer the following <laughs> comments. Um, I agree that the sort of sense of the space of a street that is then shared by the residents is, is improved by having 
sections in which the, it forms a uniform canopy and not sort of decorative individualistic plantings. Uh, which is not to say that you can't have different sections be of different types, but I would urge that the considerations of the proportionate mass of the trees be taken into account, especially. And in at least the, the first pass, going from bulky trees to a Korean mountain ash is going to make a really sort of a downer sort of impression as you go from bulkier trees to a more spindly, thin, thin tree. In sections to create different atmospheres and different characters, I think the concept is fine. But if they change from tree to tree, yeah. Uh, it, it does not reinforce the space of the street. To, to continue that discussion, how much do we need to actually pinpoint which tree goes in which location? How much flexibility can we have to say, you know, once we got the road clear and we know what trees are going to be preserved out there, to go back in and maybe change the spacing or to change the species in response to, to reinforcing other trees that are in that general locale? Mr. Emery? Madam Chair, uh, I don't know if you've had the discuss discussion with the uh, tree warden, but I imagine one of the issues that may be raised is that the width of the esplanade in some cases may not be suitable to support the tree. If it was up to him, he'd have the trees 15 no, to 25 feet uh, back. Yeah. Kew, Kew Gardens. Um, I, I don't agree with that approach, and as everyone knows, I'm a licensed landscape architect. Uh, we have an experiment going on across the street which will prove that those trees, I think they're mostly red maples, will not grow to be specimen trees, but it doesn't preclude or, or any other way prevent us from planting them there and, and hope for the best. Um, not, I mean, I... What, what particular location are you suggesting? Right across the street in front of the uh, shopping center, in front of Pond Cove. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not a civilian. <laughs> Jeez, that's a good As one. you were saying before, yes, you right across the street. Uh, the uh, so I don't. I I think that the uh, challenge is, is to put a tree within an esplanade. I think the critical issue is that the esplanade doesn't have to be parallel to the road in all cases, and a sidewalk winding meandering through the woods and back within the right-of-way would be a terrific thing to do. I know some of these lots are uh, tight and it's difficult. I think the basic issue here, are we going to design a camp road? Is this going to be a, a town road? Uh, what scale of street is it and what is the appropriate cross-section? Uh, my sense is that it would be better to know which trees are going to be cut down that are significant before construction starts or before the plans are approved by the planning board and not to go out after someone has already cut down all the mature pines and, and uh, we're left to sort of uh, fix up the, the uh, right of way that's left. In the ideal world, you know, someone might be able to go in and purchase a lot without anything having been cut and without the road cut in and elect to save some trees. Um, but I, I think that's my sense is that given how small the lots are and how narrow the road is that a lot of trees are going to be lost for house construction a lot of the, the site is going to have to be disturbed for house construction and much of the right of way will be disturbed for utility work, sidewalk construction. So I think from the standpoint of, of the, the number of trees that you're proposing may find their way onto the, onto the site in order to sort of recreate the, the uh, more rural character out there, whether they're spaced regularly or they're, they're grouped and clustered to provide more of a woodland-like setting is I think really up to um, one of the things we discussed very early on in the, in the project and what that is what is the theme of, of each neighborhood and what is it that you want to convey in terms of uh, residential character and neighborhood character. You can certainly carve out of the woods and, and obliterate all of the trees and, and sort of start from a meadow approach and do a very formal street uh, tree uh, planting. Um, Sylvan Sites is a, is a neighborhood we all talk about in, in South Portland, which has a very regular street grid and a very regular spacing of trees and alternating of shrubs between the trees. That probably was all a wooded site at one time and became, it was cut down and then became open space, and, and so it made sense to do a very uh, rigid uh, planting in there. Rigid planting can contrast nicely with the, the wilder uh, preserved open space. Uh, I, I think a, a case can be made in, in either event. I think the one thing that is very important, though, that we talked about early on is a sort of sense of neighborhood and what, what additional elements are essential to the plan, whether it's 
street trees or, or fence posts or, or mailboxes or whatever else is included in that sort of public way that keeps the character of the neighborhood and the massing of the, shelf, the, the houses. We certainly don't want to get involved in individual home design, but it is important since everyone has a right to select his own house that if the scale of the neighborhood in that street space is, is what's going to make up the neighborhood, that, that there's something between the houses and the street that provide the unifying element to, so the houses can be what they want to be. Um, so from as one planning board member, I'm, I'm sort of interested to see what you would propose and, and uh, to make the argument to us, a convincing argument uh, as to which approach was, would be more satisfactory. But I, we have approved projects in the past where we went out and walked the site and it was very, there are some areas in Cape Elizabeth that look like the Bowdoin Pines. They're very mature, tall pine stands and we've gone back and seen them really, we were told one thing was going to happen in the field, the drawings indicated something and when we went to the site it was something quite different. Uh, so I think from that standpoint, whatever, uh, in reviewing the existing trees again, I don't want you to go out there and measure every two inch caliper tree or even four inch caliper tree. but. Certainly to identify as you get into the 40 scale plans what you think are the critical trees that make up the existing vegetation that you would want to see saved regardless of the house plans or, or anything else around which all the other development can, can work. I think that works as, as successfully as a sales tool as anything else. But don't for a minute hesitate to put a tree in a median. I don't care if the median is three feet wide, put it in there. I, I, I would really yes, encourage, yeah. encourage you to yeah. do that. Not. Let the tree be what it is. <laughs> I mean, it may not be, uh, won't be one of the, the, the great uh, birches or, or beaches over at Kew Gardens, but it'll still be a nice street tree sooner or later. Mr. Wilcox. Uh, in, in terms of everything not needing to be, or in terms of whether things need or not to be totally uniform, I think of just from my personal sense that as one goes down the roads and they change in character and approach wetlands and there are, there's less density of houses and they're less less developed, that it almost would be a plus if, or a happy coincidence if those, in those areas the, the existing trees can, can come up to the road. Or if uh, when you've got a dead end spur with a hammerhead at the end and it does not form a sort of figure of circulation through the subdivision, that to take on a more rural uh, sort of natural and less formal appearance by reinforcing uh, existing trees coming up at the edge of the road. I, th I think you know, there probably could be some way to elaborate a sense of different character in the different portions of, of the neighborhoods by doing that. Uh, but in places where you have sort of uh, groups and clusters of houses that are you know, the street trees, which then form spaces, which can then unify those groups, I think, sort of make a nice complement. Uh, and you can probably work with in other situations, like what's there? Anybody else gets that sense or not? Anybody else feel like coming? Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Parker? <coughs> uh, just briefly, in having lived in Portland at one time, um, I spent probably six weeks or eight weeks uh, trying to select the correct street trees for in front of my house up in the Western Promenade. And finally, with the help of the city arborist and all this kind of stuff, we found the right trees. New Year's Eve came. My wife and I had just gotten home from a party and this Yahoo in a pickup truck came up and mowed both trees down out in front of my house. My wife jumped in the police car, went with the policeman and arrested the guy. My point in telling the story is <clears throat> accidents are going to happen, not necessarily that extreme, but if you have a too contrived streetscape of trees, something happens to one of them, whether it's a uh, fire engine backs into it or something stupid, all of a sudden the symmetry is going to be broken. I guess I, what I would like to see is a variety and possibly have the owners have some input as to what's going to be in their front yard as opposed to town telling them what's going to be in their front yard. That's, I guess, my thing. Now then, I hope that makes sense to everyone. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd, I'd like to pick up one. I, I agree uh, that it is the owner's uh, 
decision as to what's going to be in their front yard, but I think it's also, since the public right-of-way is the public right-of-way in the public realm, that the planning board at least give the owner the, the opportunity to make that decision within the front yard, but also have an understanding as to what the, this plan is going to look like as a, as a higher density development, higher than what's typically allowed in, in the zone. So at least if we have some understanding of the size and number of trees that will appear in the right-of-way, whether, they, whether they're existing, whether they're naturalized and, and clustered, or whether they're individual uh, spaced street trees, I think it's still important that it's understood when this plan is approved how many trees we would expect to find within the right-of-way or what the character of the right-of-way would be within each neighborhood. Now, and we shouldn't for a minute delude ourselves that these lots aren't going to be vastly cleared. I mean, uh, people like airiness, they like sunlight, and as you get into tighter lots, it's, it almost gets to the point that if you, if you don't clear that last tree, that there's going to be a blowdown when you get into wooded sites. So um, I think that's why the right-of-way is so critical, because I think some people will be a little surprised when they see how many trees are gone on that site. But uh, I know in, in my neighborhood, which is sort of uh, third acre lots, a lot of the trees that were planted in the late 60s now are quite mature and they're filled in among the, the very mature trees or less left as part of the woodland trees, but there, there's no street, formal street tree planting at all um, in most cases, but there's lots of street trees. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wish to speak? One more personal thing. Sure. Um, Having a lot of oak trees in my yard, I wouldn't <laughs> wish those on anyone. <laughs> they do tend to leave out. I mean, if you plant one, one's mature, you're going to have hundreds every spring. What you want to do, Steve, is be sure that you have yours and everyone else has another variety, so yours are the last one to fall and they blow into all the other neighbors' yards. <laughs> the squirrels like It's another un... <laughs> Unfavorable aspect of it. <laughs> Terry, I rather enjoy the idea. I, I, I'd like to echo both Mark's and, and um, Tom Emery's suggestions about the quality of the neighborhood generally, but I, I also am intrigued to a certain extent with the idea that one might try to find X brand of tree in one neighborhood and an emphasis at least on more trees and of a different kind in a different neighborhood again to to give certain themes universal themes throughout the project and then others to differentiate one street from another I don't know if this is enough to well, uh, go on but I, I think in the you know, all this the eventual plan, of course, will result from you know, thorough discussion. I think we're starting to have that, and mm -hmm. it is all the discussion we need to have. I think we, in the office, based the sketch that we submitted on a lot of discussion we had with the tree, uh, tree warden. Uh, you know, Rick has certain ideas. He loves the idea of variety. Uh, I happen to like it also. Um, and in some situations, it's very appropriate. Um, I think, though, that, as I said earlier, we're probably going to modify the sketch and there may be some hybrid. Maybe we'll show that within this section here, um, if we decide and talk with Peter and Juan, that we want to give the homeowner some degree of flexibility to say that you can plant you know, two or three different types of trees or, or trees in this list. But there's a lot of different ways to, to work it through. But I think I've, I'm getting a better sense uh, of what we want to see out here in, this, in, in terms of <coughs> tree planting, but also uh, tree maintenance. How do you treat the edges where the the roadway goes through common open space. Do you leave that the forest primeval? Should there be a transition from the, the wildlands uh, to the more, um, more manicured landscape right next to the right-of-way? I think we're, we, we've talked about that in some of our submittal material, how there will be a zone of tree maintenance immediately outside of the public right-of-way, so there is this sense of transition. It's not just wild woods coming down uh, and meeting the road. Um, how you then interplant among those situations, uh, I think we'll be better able to talk about the next time we, mm -hmm. we come before the board. Good. Uh, having said that, I think that the, the planting plan that we're showing you shows a, a variety they're probably going to stay with. Uh, all the trees that are out there have redeeming characteristics. Some of them have winter berries, some of them you know, are food for squirrels, some of them are good shade trees, and they probably all have their 
specific locations and their, their place. And not everybody will feel like backing over them when they drive out. Um, I think that uh, we'll probably see about the same number of trees out there, probably the same spacing. And those, those, those spacing that we're showing on the planting plans right now uh, are those that are recommended by the ordinance in terms of the number of trees per linear feet of road or number of trees per lot. Okay. Okay. It's still our intention, though, to save as many as we can I possibly. That. Yes. Are we at a natural break point or? Well, we've only got a couple odds and ends with lot 47 access. Um, as I said earlier, we are continuing a discussion on the access to the Boy Scouts. We will be developing reciprocal agreements so lot 47 can travel over lot 48 and vice versa. And I think that's what was meant by Maureen's comment. Uh, lot 77, there was a comment uh, that there's a piece of uh, the building envelope overlaps the 100 foot buffer. We applied an engineer's scale and it turns out that line that juts out there is actually 110 feet back from the edge of the, the right of way. So that's what you can call a Scrivener's error. Or, so I, I don't think that is a problem. Uh, we'll, we'll double check that with the engineers. Um, the driveways, I think, uh, we'll certainly address Maureen's comments um, when we come back before you. And I really haven't talked to uh, Peter about Exhibit A guidelines about the garage being set back from the front of the facade, but I can't imagine that's going to be a major problem. Very well. Thank you for the... Yeah. My name is Peter Anastas, Anastas Malonis. Nice to see you all again. Uh, I had a couple of questions on what was brought up tonight. Uh, first of all, Tom site and Steve, site plan layouts. We talked about some of the smaller lots. Did you want it, just so I understood, since I'll be obviously the ones getting those, it would be the smaller lots, probably the affordable housing lots as well, or and is it necessary in the large lots as well, or was that pretty much where the focus no, would be? No, I think the large lots, uh, you know, they're so large that the, the, it's more of the area where it's a higher density and, and one house really impacts the adjacent uh, utilization, the, the use of the adjacent lot. Okay. And but it's more than just the affordable house. That's correct. That's yeah. Oh, no, I know. I understand that. And it's just the smaller lots, so you want to see how they're going to fit. And we, we've already done the sketch that we talked about during preliminary. I think, I think what you're asking for is the resubmission of that as That's part correct. of the, the final. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have also taken the, the floor plans for the affordable housing and made sure that they do fit on the lots, but we'll, we'll submit that as part of the, the application. Tom, your point on symmetry and trees was well taken. Years ago, I did Royal Point, Royal Meadows. They, I discovered this machine that I could get from New Hampshire that picked up fully grown trees and I could move them all around. So I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. It was the 80s and the money was everywhere. And I spent tens of thousands moving trees everywhere and I'd line them up. And, but when one of those would die, it would be the most obvious thing. It would just, you know, it would be, everything would be out of whack and I'd have to be, you know, for years later, I'd be replacing trees. So I, I think that was a point well taken when I was sitting there anyway. Um, question I had also is, as we've worked in marketing and looking to try to make these neighborhoods a little different, we've talked about maybe having some masonry entrances, not anything elaborate, but, um, and I could bring some renderings in, but we were just sort of in the planning stages of something to set each little neighborhood apart, try to make them look old, like they've been there a while, maybe some entrance on the main entrance as you come in, but then little things for each one, like Lorenzo Way or Alicia Circle. and. Is that something that I should have, I, I suppose it is, that should get approved before we, we uh, get into it? Because obviously, it, I guess it is a structure of sorts and not just a street sign. But I was, we were looking in that same direction, too. But that's something you're going to want. I, I could easily do that, I guess, and just finalize whatever the thoughts we had. Yes, it's certainly something that I would be interested in, and it's, it feels like part of the overall right. design of the neighborhood. Is that also something you'd be receptive to, or? Yeah, I certainly would. Okay, I tried putting in one neighborhood, put little blast brass plaques on, but every June they became the <laughs> trophy prize to, to get on your dorm room, I think, so may have to be something else. <laughs> That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? Yep. Yeah. Um, has the focus shifted a little bit? Are we, we are now starting to create neighborhoods within neighborhoods as opposed to 
one neighborhood? I think we've always talked about neighborhoods within the overall Dominicus Cross. Now we're really trying to delineate it. We're trying to do it with trees and with entrance features and everything else. So you're making really distinct, separate neighborhoods within the neighborhood. Is it I, pricing or what is it? And what is the I think that's for? always been uh, the discussion we've had. That uh, the first the first neighborhood down here will probably be smaller homes and smaller lots, and as we get up to here, there'll be larger homes and larger lots, and each one will have to have their own identifying features, be it trees or landscape detailing or whatever. I think what you're seeing is a natural progression as we go through the design process to start focusing in on those details of the, the project. Do I hear any further discussion or a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, just one other yes. comment I think that fits in with all the questions that have been raised. That's the issue of street lighting. I saw a catalog, not a catalog cut, but I saw a detail that called out a spalding, looked like a typical road fixture on it. Uh, I just, I don't know if we have catalog cuts or not of what you're proposing, but I think that's part of the overall ambiance and whether you have a lot of it or not much of it or, or whatever your approach is going to be for that. Mr. Wilcox. Uh, one of the things that I was mentioned in the draft maps that I was wondering if we could maybe go into a little bit further later on, and that is the, the appearance of the wet ponds and riprap spillways from Wells Road. Uh, in the uh, first pass of the landscaping plan, it, it appears that uh, the grading really is with respect to, in that area, limited to the wet ponds themselves, and there are some what look like fairly large riprap spillways shown. We have one behind the high school now that is sort of this huge sculpture of rocks that never gets water draining down through it except in a hundred year storm. Uh, and the landscaping in that area, there's a lot of variety of landscaping, but in terms of earth forms and anything with some mass to sort of break up the appearance of these huge cascading moon rock beds slicing down through in what used to be a wooded area next to a scenic road. I think that's an area where if you could sort of take a look at that and have any good ideas of how to sort of improve the appearance of these marvels of engineering, it would be, it would be very appreciated okay. on my part. <coughs> Anything else from any other board member? No. <laughs> you sure? No, no. <laughs> We have some discussion about where we are taking this in terms of additional site walks if necessary, additional meetings scheduled, public hearings, and so forth. Anybody wish to comment? I guess my sense of it certainly is that uh, I don't know about a sidewalk. I would certainly urge another public hearing just because this is a project that has a, a certain impact. And although I think we've heard from a fair number of, of people uh, in the process of uh, of processing this one. I guess my, my general sense is to have a public hearing unless there's a, a reason not to. Uh, but I'm simply one board member on this one, so I'd be happy to hear if anybody else has any further thoughts or diff different thoughts. Uh, Madam Chairman, yes. as to sidewalk, uh, since uh, being the new, the, the new kid um, uh, in talking to the town planner, uh, we thought about it. we could arrange for me to uh, your private that, viewing uh, a private uh, viewing if uh, is that is that not right Maureen? That yes that's correct it would have to be I, a I public viewing I take it that you would yes. be more than <laughs> <laughs> more than willing to accommodate the board, board I'll member. work that out with uh, mm -hmm. bring your RV vehicle <laughs> does, does the board want another sidewalk that's really <laughs> Mr. Parker says no, Mr. Wilcox says no, Mr. Connor says no. <laughs> we remember it beautifully in terms of the site, so not a problem. I guess what we could do is anyone who wants to go along with the new board member certainly could if uh, so. Anything else that you would need from us in terms of suggestions this evening? When might a public hearing be then, if we were to hold one? Well, now that we're complete, we can hold it uh, next time, if that's uh, appropriate, or later on. What? Let me ask you, how long do you think you need to um, 
cover all of the issues that are before the, the board on the final subject. I, I guess I really haven't heard anything of great substance that's going to cause us to wait another two months to come back. I like to think we're going to be back uh, for the March meeting. Now, of course, we haven't heard from engineering. We don't know what Correct. they're going to uncover, but um, I, I, as my understanding, they're, they're underway at least with the engineering review. And we certainly anticipate the report by the March packet. Yes. So, oh, um, I don't know what other, what do other board members is there what in terms of uh, final subdivision approval as opposed to preliminary? Do we normally hold another public hearing, or do we normally not, or is it a judgment call? I I believe in the last five years you have typically held another public hearing just because the process has usually taken a long time. There have been some projects where um, they were preliminary approved prior to ordinance amendments, DEP approvals, and it was a year to a year and a half before they came back for final approval. So you, you've done that um, on two major projects that I can think of. It's, it's at the option of the board. You're not required to hold another public hearing. I guess my suggestion would be to have a public hearing noticed for the next meeting the same time that we are continuing to process this and if it turns out that we're able to accommodate and accomplish everything at the next meeting, so much the better. If not, I don't think that we've unduly prolonged the process and we've certainly given the public every opportunity to, mm -hmm. to comment along the way. Madam Chair, I think that would be, uh, it would be an excellent opportunity to have another public hearing from a couple of standpoints. There's an abutter who has been here every evening, who was in here this evening, who I understand is no longer uh, opposed to the project. Uh, we've gotten a number of letters that have nothing to do with this application, but who have made comments about this project, about the town's uh, sort of uh, helter-skelter development, and I think it would be appropriate to allow the applicant to once again to make the presentation to the public and allow further public input so that everyone can, before we go to final approval, everyone can see that the project's back before us. They have an opportunity to make a final comment, and uh, this project is given the due respect that a project of this magnitude and a cluster development uh, should be afforded in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. That's nicely said. Do I hear a motion? Can I, can I just ask please, one more comment, raise one more comment before? Uh, uh, this is regarding the survey. Um, I, I know Steve, Steve Ross, his wife serves on the board at Campfire, and uh, he's a wonderful surveyor. But if I had to sit down and, and based on the survey, determine where the boundary of this parcel is, I, I, I can't do it. And I just request that if you could have Steve do something with a line work or use tape or something so that when this becomes the final approved subdivision and this is part of the package, it's very clearly understood where the outline of the parcel is. I know that it shows up on all the plat plans and everything else, but it's, I, I just find it very confusing to try to follow it. And then uh, after saying that, I'll move that we uh, table the application uh, for a public hearing to the next regular meeting of the planning board. Read this, uh, please. <coughs> Shall I face the shopping center as I read? <laughs> <laughs> and salute it, right? Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials uh, submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company for Dominicus Crossing. A 97 lot plus one multifamily unit subdivision located on Wells Road and Sawyer Road be deemed complete. Be it further ordered that the application be tabled to the regular March 18th, 1997 meeting at which time a public hearing shall be held. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Parker seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor of uh, both motions? Please raise your right hand. Thank you. That's unanimous. We'll see you at the March meeting. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Probably would have been tacky of me to congratulate Carrie Kurtz, the butter on, on coaching and winning the Boys State Swimming Championship yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. That's why I didn't raise it. Who won? Who won? Who won? Who won? Who There being no further business to come before the planning board, the planning board meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're not having any discussion of the goals. Of yeah. I just beg your pardon. Yes, it was. It was on the agenda, and I think we probably ought to uh, affirm it. You you submitted the draft of. Uh, yes. Do okay. you want me to put the tape back in and make notes of it? Yeah, it's a good idea because I think we're going to get it done pretty fast. You discussed the items. Correct. 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 All right, the uh, draft planning board goals for 1997 are in your packet in draft form, and is there anybody who has any comment on any of this? I have one question. Yes. The uh, numbering doesn't imply a priority, does it, or does it? No. Well, what's your comment? I mean, I think before sometimes we have put the one or two items that were most important at the head of the list and tried to list them in somewhat an order of uh, descending priority. Would you like to move any particular item around? I guess I'd like to uh, move, this would be a long discussion, <laughs> I'd like to move number five uh, to the number two position. So the first one would remain the uh, refresher session on the new zoning ordinance. The second would remain the post-approval coordination improvement. But then DEP certification would become number three. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I'm suggesting. Oh, to number two. Become number two, and number two become number three. Uh huh. Uh huh. So we'll be in a learning mode for mm -hmm. this particular year. Anybody have any comment on that proposal? I can't hear you. Since number two is coming around for a second year in a row, it gains importance by its duration. I think that is a good suggestion, actually. Um, so moving from the bottom up, we'll still have schools on the agenda, but and then training above that and GIS information above that. Any other comments? With the moving up of the DEP certification to the number two slot, can we approve these goals and um, adopt them for the current year. All in favor? <clears throat> Sounds good. Unanimous it is. Anything else to come before the planning board? Now I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, in, in the event that we choose not to adjourn the meeting, do we, are we offer that opportunity to uh, question whether or not we should adjourn? <laughs> I guess we just did. I'm I, I'm going to look it up between now and next time. I, yeah.